Hi, it's Chance. Um, today I wanted to try something out. Um, something that kind of maybe shares something about my thought process and uh, how I get to some of the places that I get to. I taken a lot of different kinds of media. It's not just um, videos or lecture series. Uh, I read quite a bit too. I actually, you know, I hear people talk about these books and I buy them and I read them. And I don't read one at a time straight through. I bust it up into pieces. I jump around a lot and uh, I read multiple books at the same time. Here's uh, two that I was reading in parallel. The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis and The Consolation of Philosophy by Boethius. And uh, also I was, uh, I think I was reading the Book of Job at the same time, which is uh, very, I mean, those two books are in step uh, very closely. A while back, um, Pastor Paul talked about the very final character in the uh, series of people who came up uh, from the abyss into the heavenly realm and were kind of uh, appealed to by people who were not in the abyss. And uh, it really caught my attention. And I think it's very central to a lot of what's going on as far as the uh, culture wars and uh, this this issue of uh, grievances and uh, playing on sympathies and this sort of a thing. And as the corner grows a little bit and uh, people come in, I think part of this will be, you know, getting to know people and where they're at and how to deal with uh, some of the common issues of our day and I, I hope that today this reading will uh, help give some insight and perspective on perhaps just kind of an orientation for how to proceed not any kind of a prescribed method or anything um, so I'll start with uh, Boethius here Consolation of Philosophy. The text opens this way. It's there's each chapter starts with a poem. So uh, this is a poem. Book one, chapter one. I, who once wrote songs with joyful zeal, am driven by grief to enter weeping mode. See the muses, cheeks all torn, dictate, and wet my face with elegiac verse. No terror could discourage them at least from coming with me on my way. They were the glory of my happy youth, and they still comfort me in hapless age. Old age came suddenly by suffering sped, and grief then bade her government began. My hair untimely white upon my head, and I, a worn out bone bag hung with flesh. Death would be a blessing if it spared the glad but heeded invocations from the wretch. Does that sound like, you know, this recent kind of foray into euthanasia-assisted suicide? I mean, there's kind of like a, an intuitive uh, argument for it that's being articulated here in this poem. But now death's ears are deaf to hopeless cries, his hands refuse to close poor weeping eyes, while with success false fortune favored me. One hour of sadness could not have thrown me down, but now her trustless countenance is clouded. Small welcome to the days that lengthen life. Foolish, the friends who called me happy then, only they knew where I was going. For falling shows a man stood insecure. Folks, we're all going to die. It, it all ends that way. Don't know what to tell you. Uh, while I was quietly thinking these thoughts over to myself 
and giving vent to my sorrow with the help of my pen, I became aware of a woman standing over me. She was of awe-inspiring appearance, her eyes burning and keen beyond the usual power of men. She was so full of years that I could hardly think of her as my own generation, and yet she possessed a vivid color and undiminished vigor. It was difficult to be sure of her height, for sometimes she was of average human size, while at other times she seemed to touch the very sky with the top of her head, and when she lifted herself even higher, she pierced it and was lost to human sight. Her clothes were made of imperishable material, of the finest thread, woven with the most delicate skill. Later, she told me that she had made them with her own hands. Their splendor, however, was obscured by a kind of film, as of long neglect, like statues covered in dust. On the bottom hem can be read the uh, embroidered Greek letter pi, and on the top hem, the Greek letter theta. Between the two, a ladder of steps rose from the lower, lower to the higher ladder, very reminiscent of the uh, ladder of divine ascent. I mean, it's kind of a tro it's not equivalent, but there's something there. Her dress had been torn by the hands of marauders who each carried off such pieces as he could get. There were some books in her right hand, and in her left hand she held a scepter. At the sight of the muses of poetry, at my bedside dictating words to accompany my tears, she became angry. Who, she demanded, her piercing eyes alight with fire, has allowed these hysterical sluts to approach this sick man's bedside? <laughs> she ain't mincing words here. They have no medicine to ease his pains, only sweetened poisons to make them worse. These are the very creatures who slay the rich and fruitful harvest of reason with the barren thorns of passion. They habituate men to their sickness of mind instead of curing them. If, as usual, it was only some ordinary man you were carrying off, a victim of your blandishments, it would matter little to me. There would be no harm done to my work. But this man has been nourished on the philosophies of Zeno and Plato. Sirens is a better name for you and your deadly enticements. Be gone and leave him for my own muses to heal and cure. So there's some distinction here as to like the muses. So the former muses are the muses of passion, I suppose. It's, you know, this whole woe is me wallowing uh, thing. And, and we can see, if we look through this lens at some of the things in culture, we see that these muses have always been with us, and they're getting louder. Um, as a kid, I really, really loved George Jones's voice. I love this music. And some of his later songs, like the song Choices, uh, are, are a powerful reflection on his life and the life that he lived. But a lot of his music is just, it makes you want to die. It makes death seem like a sweet thing. And it implies a certain fatalism. Not, not as in, you know, seeking death, although maybe that's the ultimate aim always, but uh, as in, you know, things are just fixed and deterministic. There is no agency. There's nothing you can do. You're in a hole, you're stuck. So, from uh, Boethius, I'd like to go to Lewis now, uh, to this final character, uh, Paul went over uh, the, the lady, and, you know, it's kind of a long description, but uh, I'll, I'll go for the, the short part of that here. Uh-oh, i got to find it. Every beast and bird that came near her had its place in her love. In her they became themselves. And now the abundance of life she has in Christ from the Father flows over into them. So it sounds like, you know, 
She wasn't proselytizing for most of her existence, but she formed these living connections with people. You know, she just kind of was able to radiate a sort of uh, living energy that, that bettered people's lives and, and uh, formed these strong connections and it was just like, a, like a, an eternal spring of some sort. Uh, while we spoke, the lady was steadily advancing towards us, but it was not at us she looked. Following in the direction of her eyes, I turned and saw an oddly shaped phantom approaching. So all the people who came up from the abyss, they're phantoms. They're kind of like thin versions of themselves because they've, their molecules have been stretched out in this greater space and now they're very, very thin. Um, or rather, two phantoms. A great tall ghost, horribly thin and shaky, who seemed to be leading on a chain another ghost no bigger than an organ grinder's monkey. The taller ghost wore a soft black hat, and he reminded me of something that my memory could not quite recover. Then, when he had come within a few feet of the lady, he spread out his lean, shaky hand uh, flat on his chest, and with the fingers wide apart ex exclaimed in a hollow voice, At last! All at once I realized what it was he had put me in mind of. He was like a seedy actor of the old school. Darling, at last, said the lady. Good heavens, thought I. Surely she can't. Like, she's associated with this guy? And, and then I noticed two things. In the first place, I noticed that the little ghost was not being led by the big one. It was the dwarfish figure that held the chain in its hand around the theatrical figure, that wore the collar around its neck. In the second place, I noticed that the lady was looking solely at the dwarf ghost. She seemed to think it was the dwarf who had addressed her, or else she was deliberately ignoring the other. On the poor dwarf, she turned her eyes. Love shone not from her face only, but from all her limbs, as if it were some liquid in which she had just been bathing. Then, to my dismay, she came nearer. She stooped down and kissed the dwarf. It made one shudder to see her in such close contact with that cold, damp, shrunken thing. But she did not shudder. Frank, she said, before anything else, forgive me. For all I ever did uh, wrong and for all I did not do right since the first day we met, I ask your pardon. I looked properly at the dwarf for the first time now, or perhaps when he received her kiss, he became a little more visible. One could just make out the sort of face he must have uh, had when he was a man. A little oval freckled face with a weak chin and a tiny wisp of unsuccessful mustache. He gave her a glance, not a full look. He was watching the tragedian out of the corner of his eyes. Then he gave a jerk to the chain. And it was the tragedian, not he, who answered the lady. There, there, said the tragedian. We'll say no more about it. We all make mistakes. With the words, there came over his features a ghastly contortion, which I think was meant for an indulgently playful smile. We'll say no more, he continued. It's not myself I'm thinking about. It is you. That is what has been continually on my mind all these years. The thought of you... You here alone, breaking your heart about me. But now, said the lady to the dwarf, you can set all that aside. Never think like that again. It's, it's over. Her beauty brightened so that I could hardly see anything else, and under that sweet compulsion, the dwarf really looked at her for the first time. For a second, I thought he was growing more like a man. He opened his mouth. He himself was going to speak this time. But oh, the disappointment when the words came. You missed me? He croaked out in a small, bleeding voice. Yet even then, she was not taken aback. Still the love and courtesy flowed from her. Dear, you will understand about that very soon, she said. But today, what happened next gave me a shock. The dwarf and tragedy and spoke in unison, not to her, but to one another. You'll notice, they warned one another, she hasn't answered our question. 
I realized then that they were one person, or rather that both were the remains of what had once been one person. The dwarf again rattled the chain. You miss me, said the tragedian to the lady, throwing a dreadful theatrical tremor into his voice. Dear friend, said the lady, still attending exclusively to the dwarf, you may be happy about that, and about everything else. Forget all about it forever. And really, for a moment, I thought the dwarf was going to obey, partly because the outlines of his face became a little clearer, and partly because the invitation to all joy, singing out of her whole being, like a bird's song on an April evening, seemed to me such that no creature could resist it. Then he hesitated. And then, once more, he and his accomplice spoke in unison. Of course, it would be rather fine and magnanimous to not press the point, they said to one another. But can we be sure she'd notice? We've done these sorts of things before. There was a time we let her have the last stamp in the house to write her mother and said nothing, although she had known we wanted to write a letter to ourselves, or a letter ourselves. We thought she'd remember and see how unselfish we'd been, but she never did. And there was the time, oh, and lots of times. So the dwarf gave a shake to the chain and, so I'll interject here. Uh, this is not agape. Um, agape is that love that keeps no record. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs or of you know, rights to be used as, as currency or bargaining chips. Um, so it's very transactional. So that, that's the key thing that I'm seeing here is the transactionalism of his approach to the relationship. I can't forget it, cried the tragedian, and I won't forget it either. I could forgive them all they've done uh, to me, but for your miseries. Oh, don't you understand, said the lady. There are no miseries here. Do you mean to say, answered the dwarf, as if this new idea had made him quite forget the tragedy in for a moment, do you mean to say you've been happy? Didn't you want me to be? But no matter. Want it now? Or don't think about it at all? was her response. The dwarf blinked at her. One can see an unheard, uh, unheard of idea trying to enter his little mind. One could see even that there was for him some sweetness in it. There's a battle going on inside. For a second, he had almost let the chain go. Then, as if it were his lifeline, he clutched it once more. Look here, said the tragedian. Well, we've got to face this. He was using his manly bullying tone this time, the one for bringing women to their senses. Darling, said the lady to the dwarf, there's nothing to face. You don't want me to have been miserable for misery's sake. You only think I must have been if I loved you. But if you'll only wait, to, uh, you'll see that it isn't so. Love, said the tragedian, striking his forehead with his hand, and then a few notes deeper. Love, do you know the meaning of the word? How should I not, said the lady. I am in love. In love. Do you understand? Yes, now I truly love. You mean, said the, the tragedian, you mean you did not love me truly in the old days? Only in a poor sort of way, she answered. I have asked you to forgive me. There was a little real love in it. But what we called love down there was mostly the craving to be loved. In the main, I loved you for my own sake, because I needed you. So we're seeing codependency emerge. Um, so I, I'm going to take a little diversion here. What I'm doing is I'm taking the implicit and making it explicit here, which again, has its time and place, and there's a risk of, like, killing the thing. I, I had a really good conversation with uh, Brad last night, and one of the things um, that occurred to me in that conversation was uh, that it takes a chorus of people 
and maybe the first person says it explicitly and suddenly the defenses are raised and it's not going to get through and so we can look at that alone and say well that was a fruitless effort and it's wrong don't do that don't make it explicit here's my experience you need the idea presented explicitly and you're going to reject it but it's planted in the soil of your mind everyone else's job is to point at it through implicit means and help it spring forth so there's a period of uh, germination incubation there's like a, a latency between the explicit seed being planted and then the idea sprouting forth and I think what the, the inputs that help it to grow and sprout forth is um, what Verveke talks about when he talks about plausibility. It enhances the plausibility of something when you have uh, convergence from multiple independent sources. This course of people is not a, a centrally planned thing. Like, it just happens. Truth is like that. Um, it, it arises organically. I can't help but come out. Um, and I think this is, you know, maybe what's what's being pointed out, you know, when we hear that the rocks will cry out and, you know, the dead things of the world will uh, proclaim God's goodness. It's that the truth will come through and, and it can't be suppressed ultimately. Um, so I'll continue here. Uh, so they're talking about love, and, uh, oh, you didn't really love me. And she said, no, I did. There was some real love in there, but it wasn't the real thing. But now I've got the real thing. And now, said the tragedian, with a hackneyed gesture of despair, now you need me no more. But of course not, said the lady. And her smile made me wonder how both the phantoms could refrain from crying out with joy. What needs... Could I have? She said, now that I have all, I am full, not empty. I am in love, capitalized, himself. Not lonely, strong, not weak. You'll be the same. Come and see. We shall have no need for one another now. We can begin to love truly. But the tragedy in was still striking attitudes. She needs me no more, no more. No more, he said in a choking voice to no one in particular. Would to God, he continued, but he was now pronouncing in good. Would to God, I had seen her lying dead at my feet before I heard those words. Lying dead at my feet. Lying dead at my feet. And just, I mean, this guy is just, ugh, it's tough to stomach. I do not know how long the creature intended to go on repeating that phrase, for the lady put an end to that. Frank! Frank! She cried out in a voice that made the whole wood ring. Look at me! Look at me! What are you doing with that great ugly doll? Let go of the chain! Send it away! It is you I want! Don't you see what nonsense it's talking? I wonder how many of us who are kind of mulling coming out into the open and starting to produce a little bit of content like this are wrestling with the idea of, you know, am I worthy? I think that's what the door here is uh, dealing with. Like, it's, like it, it's impossible to him because he doesn't feel worthy. Uh, but if you would just cross over and give it a try, you might be surprised. Don't you see what nonsense it's talking? Merriment danced in her eyes. She was sharing a joke with the dwarf, right over the head of the tragedian. Something not at all unlike a smile struggled to appear on the dwarf's face, for he was looking at her now. Her laughter was past his first defenses. He was struggling hard to keep it out, but already with imperfect success. Man, levity is a great tool at the right moment for getting through defenses. It's... I mean, I don't know how many times my kids have been throwing a fit and just 
being completely obstinate and I'll just I'll notice the right moment that there's the possibility of turning it around and I'll just go in for a tickle real quick and do it. You know, we'll have a laugh for a minute and it's like, hey, is it really that serious? And, and they'll be able to come back out of it. I, I think that's the move being made here. Against his will, he was even growing a little bigger. Oh, you great goose, said she. What is the good of talking like that here? You know as well as I do that you did see me lying dead years and years ago. Not at your feet, of course, but on a bed in a nursing home. A very good nursing home. <laughs> Sorry, my cats. A very good nursing home it was, too. Matron would never have dreamed of leaving bodies lying about the floor. So it's just like you're exaggerating things. You're kind of taking flight into your delusions in order to make things worse. Let's look at the reality. It's ridiculous for that doll to try to be impressive about death here. It just it won't work. I do not know that I ever saw anything more